Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Life Application Bible Study at Excel Church. I'm so glad that you were able to join us on tonight. My name is Pastor Alicia. On behalf of Pastor Charles and all of the members of Excel Church, we thank you for joining us on tonight. Um, tonight, we will be exclusively broadcasting here on YouTube uh, because we are having some technical difficulties, as it may be, um, with the telephone service that we utilize um, to deliver the uh, lesson uh, by telephone as well as by um, the internet as well. So for those of you who are tuning in with us for the first time, um, my understanding is that if you are using a laptop at least, you should be able to interact with us over the course of the broadcast um, simply by using the chat feature on the side of the screen. Um, and so for those of you that are doing that, it would be fantastic if you could go ahead and send some type of message just so that I can see how that functionality is working and make sure that everything is working correctly. Um, and then for those of you who just intend to follow along, then that's wonderful as well. I would just invite you to grab your Bibles um, because we are about to begin our time together in our life application Bible study. So I'm so excited to have you here with us on this evening. And um, I believe that we're going to really uh, be blessed by what it is the Lord wants to do with us on tonight. So let's go ahead and get started with our prayer. Uh, hopefully you already came prepared with your Bible. Um, if not, go ahead and grab that very quickly. And we're going to dive right into the word of God as we complete our prayer. Are you ready? All right, Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you right now for this life application Bible study. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study, to show ourselves approved, workmen that needed not be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. Father, we're asking that you will just enlighten our time together, enlighten our understanding of your word, draw us closer to you, and let us not just be hearers of your word, but Father, let us be doers also so that we give you all the praise and all the honor and all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So as you may have seen already from the title, um, as you clicked on this live event tonight on YouTube, tonight we're going to be talking about the cross. And I thought that this would be fitting because um, oftentimes as we prepare during this time of year, um, the emphasis is on so many things other than uh, what really this season is to embody. Um, and so even as we have the pressure from our um, little ones to make sure that their baskets are filled with lots of goodies uh, and uh, the pressure from the department stores uh, to run out and make certain we have uh, the snazziest outfits for them and ourselves <laughs> uh, on Sunday as well. Um, I did not want all of those festivities to get um, to overshadow uh, what it is that we really are celebrating and um, that is the cross. So if you would, would you just start with me um, as we do tonight's lesson and really um, look at closely the cross of Christ. And then as we interact during different points, again, if the chat feature is working correctly, um, I would love to be able to interact with you um, and take your comments and also um, have you participate that way as well. So. Um, if you would turn with me to Matthew chapter 16, we're going to start in verse 24. If you're there, type amen. All right. I want to see how this is going. It's just type amen if you're there because I don't see anything yet. All right. Hopefully this is going to work out okay. All right. Matthew chapter 16. Are you there? All right. We're going to read just verse 24. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, and it reads, and remember, um, I teach out of the New Living Translation, so if what I'm saying sounds different than what you have in your Bible, uh, it could be because we're not using the same translation. So out of the New Living Translation, Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 reads, then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross, and follow me. Huh, he gave us three different requirements. All right, viewers, talk to me real quickly. What are the three different requirements that Jesus just gave us if we want to be his follower? All right, so let's see you talk and chat with me. 
Um, hopefully this is working. I will know in a minute. The three requirements he just gave us. And then if you've typed something and I don't see it and you know my number, can you let me know so that I know that it is not working as I expected it to um, because I'm double checking, double checking. I don't see any comments and I don't see your comments. So I don't know if it's because you haven't tried to answer the question or if it's because something's not working correctly. So in the interest of time, I'll go ahead and answer that question while we figure out if the chat feature is working properly. And those three requirements that Jesus gave his disciples um, are here and it's very clear. He says, the first thing we have to do is turn from our selfish ways. That's the first thing. Um, the second thing we have to do is to take up our cross. That's the second thing. And the third thing we have to do is follow him. Wow, that, that's the recipe right there. If we call ourselves Christians, if we call ourselves believers, if we call ourselves followers of Christ, then these are three things that we must be doing. And that is turning from our own selfish ways. That means we are putting aside our desires and putting his desire for us first. Um, and then what we've learned as Christians is as we do that, then he blesses us with the desires of our heart anyway, if they are in line with what it is he desires to do through us and in us. And so we learn to go ahead and put aside our agenda and say, okay, Lord, I submit my agenda to yours. Lord knows I know what that means after you've gone through undergraduate school and gone through law school and thought you were going to be um, doing one thing and then the Holy Spirit arrests you and God takes you in and says, I have a totally different plan for you. And um, he, of course, took me on a different path and um, the practice of law was not part of that plan. So it does require us to put aside our plans, put aside what we came up with um, and to follow him. I love Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. It says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct our path. So we know that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And so we just recondition ourselves and our training ourselves that, you know what, I have to put aside my desires, my ways, my plan, and I have to first submit to what it is that he wants for me if I call myself a Christian. Amen. And then the second thing we saw was to take up your cross. Wow. How powerful is that? Can you text with me or type with me and let me know if you can still see all of this? Because I, I, this is good and I don't want you to be missing it. And I do want you to also be able to um, communicate with me. But when we talk about taking up our cross, we know that that means that we have to make a true commitment to Christ at the risk of everything, at the risk of death, that there's no turning back. We know that there are people right now um, that are dying because of their faith. And some of us, because of our convenience, you know, we live in a country and we operate in a time right now uh, that allows us to openly demonstrate our faith. But even then, many of us have experienced um, ridicule, um, persecution and um, other types of detriment by picking up that cross and by saying, no, I'm going to do it God's way. Um, even in the midst of um, others trying to encourage us to do something differently, um, to do something in a way that is not godly, in a way that doesn't please him. And we have faced that type of opposition um, when we won't conform and do it the way the world does it. And we say, no, I'm a follower of Christ above all else. And sometimes we have to do like Daniel. And we just have to do it the way that we know that God wants and trust that he's going to elevate us in the presence of those that did not believe and that that is going to bring glory to God's name because they're going to look at you and they're going to say, wow, I know they had to be God that elevated him. I know they had to be God that elevated her because they didn't do it the way that I thought they needed to do. And they recognized that you took a prescription from the word of God and that that took you higher than anything you could have gotten 
from what they were trying to give to you. So we have to take up that cross. We have to be willing to be ridiculed, to be persecuted, to even die if need be, because we follow him and wherever he leads us, we're going. Amen. So that's the second requirement he gave us. And he said, and follow me. That in and of itself is powerful because you know how we are people. Let's just keep it real. Sometimes we like to run ahead. Sometimes we like to, you know, go our own way. But in order to follow anybody, especially in order to follow Christ, you have to allow them to lead. And that's the one thing that is so powerful because many of us, we made a decision that we wanted Jesus Christ to be our savior. That was a no brainer. We didn't want to go to hell. We wanted a savior. We wanted to be reconciled so that we would have eternal life and life more abundantly. So that was an easy sale. Yes, God, you, I need to accept Jesus. He's the way, the truth, and the life, and I want him in my life. But when it comes down to making him our Lord, in addition to making him our Savior, many of us start to struggle in that area because we really are accustomed to being the Lord of our own lives. We are accustomed to making our own way, making our own decisions, and charting out our own paths. And so we begin to bump heads oftentimes until we learn how to submit and to follow his lead. And so it, he makes it clear to us, then you need to reevaluate what you really are, because until you are able to do that, you really are a follower of Christ until you learn how to follow. That's self-explanatory. You must learn how to follow. And what you find is when you learn how to follow Christ, Christ will elevate you because you can never be a leader until you learn how to be a great follower. Let me say that again. You can never be a great leader until you learn how to be a great follower. So those of us that are Christians that have taken up our cross and we have made a commitment to him that we will follow him no matter what, no matter where he goes, no matter where he takes us through the ups and the downs, through the hills and the valleys, in the shadow of death, we won't fear any evil. As we learn how to do that, then he elevates us. He prepares us to be great leaders and others will be willing to follow us. So this is something that will bless you, whether you're in ministry, whether you're in business, whether you're just trying to lead your family, as you begin to have a need for others to respect your authority and to follow you when you say, this is the direction we're going on. You have to begin to first do that in your relationship with Christ. The Bible says that you shall reap what you sow. So if you sow disobedience unto him, if you sow being a renegade Christian that he can't tell you anything, that you won't submit to anything he tells you to do, then that's what you reap in your personal life. Then the people who should submit to you, your children, um, if you're married and you're a male, um, your wife, uh, if you are a boss, your staff, if you are a manager, um, your employees, if you're a business person, you know, whatever. It is a principle that if you want to see a change in your own life, and that's why I like life application Bible study, because we're studying the Bible with a specific um, purpose of seeing how to apply it in every area of our life just our everyday life. And so you begin to see that, okay, I've got a master following Christ before I ask anyone to follow me. And as I master following him, then the desire to follow me is going to be greater for those that are under my authority because they see the Christ in me. Amen. That's, 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 that's revelatory right there. They'll see the Christ in you. They'll see the God in you. They'll see how God is blessing you, how God is taking you to places that they only imagine being, and they'll be willing to follow you because you're following Christ. All right, let's move on. Next scripture I want to look at is Matthew chapter 27. Would you turn with me, please? Matthew chapter 27. We're going to read verses 39 through 42. Matthew chapter 27. Flip with me, Bible readers. Matthew chapter 27, we're going to read a little bit now because I want you to see the whole context of what this is going to mean for you as you are a follower of Christ. Matthew chapter 27, verses 39 through 42. All right, people, is my chat feature working? Because I sure am not seeing any chats. So you guys are either really quiet tonight or I'm going to need my internet buddy 
uh, and she knows who she is to help me to work out the kinks with this before next week's uh, life application Bible study. Did you hear that, Michelle? All right. Okay. So Matthew 27 verses 39 through 42. 39 through 42. It says the people passing by shouted abuse, shaking their hands in mockery. Look at you now, they yelled at him. Hmm. You said you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Well, then, if you are the son of God, save yourself and come down from the cross. Verse 41, the leading priests, <laughs> the teachers of religious law and the elders also mocked Jesus. He saved others, they scoffed, but he can't save himself. So he is the king of Israel, is he? Let him come down from the cross right now and we will believe in him. Oof, you gotta bear with me because a lot of times I have a hard time um, with these texts. Um, it took me many years to see the passion of the Christ. Um, because of my love for him, it is very difficult for me um, to internalize anyone talking to him that way, anyone treating him that way, anyone doing that to him. And so I don't care how long I've been saying, I don't care how many years it's been, whenever we get to the point where we have to go through his crucifixion and we, because I'm a person who internalizes, you know, when I read a story, I feel it. I, I transport myself. I'm in the story. I'm there. I'm in the moment. I feel the emotions. And so I feel like I'm there watching them do this to my Lord. And it's, 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 it's a lot. Um, but nevertheless, he did that for me. He did that for you. And because of that, that drives me to live for him every day, recognizing the sacrifices he did for he made for me. Um, and if you are a parent, you understand that, you know, we make sacrifices daily for our children. And the hope is that they will one day get to a point, you know, when they're little, they don't understand. But the hope is that they will one day get to a point where they will recognize what we went through for them and that that will push them to greatness, that they will recognize that I got to do better because, you know, my mom sacrificed for me. My dad, he worked hard for me. You know, I think about that even when I think about um, those that pre preceded us and our culture. You know, every time I feel like I don't want to go vote, I remember you know, the sacrifices that somebody else made for me to even have the right to do that. And so there's so many levels in which we are indebted to those that have come before us, but in no level compares to the debt we have to him. And so we see here that the, the religious leaders are ridiculing him. Um, and the question I wanted to pose if um, the chat feature was working properly was, do you think that had he come down, do you think that if he would have just got down off the cross, that that would have made them believe? If the chat feature is working, I'm just going to double check. Let me repeat the question for those of you that are actually trying to answer the question. As you know, we are in Matthew chapter 27, verses 39 through 42. And we just read a passage that um, showed us the type of ridicule and um you know, one of the people said here, you know, well, if you're the son of God, save yourself and come down from the cross. And the question I threw out to you, um, and it could just be a hypothetical if you can't answer it, if your chat feature isn't working, um, is if, if he would have come down, if he would have got done off the cross, do you think that they would have believed him? Now, the reason why I like this question is because it really reminds me of what Pastor was talking about on um, Sunday. And uh, I love how he broke down, you know, Palm Sunday and came from a, a perspective that, you know, I've been saved many, many years and the revelation he gave us on Sunday, I, I've never received it. It was powerful. But one of the things that was my takeaway was that when you are on an assignment from God, that nothing ought to discourage you from completing it. And that means whether the people are applauding you, or as you see here, whether the people are coming against you, it matters not to the assignment that you have 
from God. And man, did that encourage me because come on people, let's keep it real. Sometimes we gauge how we're doing based off of um, the response of the people that are around us. They're our mirror. So, you know, if, if we're trying to lose weight and nobody says anything, we're thinking, oh, well, this must not be working. I must not have lost any weight. They haven't noticed it. Or if we're trying to do a good job, you know, on our, our job and um, the coworkers, the supervisors, you know, nobody's noticing, nobody's saying anything. You know, if we're not careful, then we'll adjust our efforts and our output based on the input and the feedback we get. So they don't notice it. OK, well, I stop it. You know, if, if, if I don't get praised, OK, well, you know, maybe I won't try so hard next time. But what we took away from Sunday and what we have to take away from this passage right here in Matthew chapter 27, verses 39 through 42, is that what they have to say about wherever you're at and whatever you're doing and whatever the condition is, is immaterial to the overall assignment of God. We have to stay focused because here's the thing. Even if Jesus would have got down off that cross, I, I would best believe that that would not have convinced them. He had to do it God's way. He couldn't, you know, start operating in his flesh and say, you know what? They're not about to talk to me like that. Let me get off of this cross and I'm going to show them something. No. Now, you know, maybe one of us. That might have been a temptation. You know how that is. You know, somebody just keep trying to pull your card and you're trying to be saved. You're trying to act right. You know, you try to keep your composure, but they just keep pushing that button until you just say, you know what? Let me show them something. <laughs> you know, Jesus, it was it, it had no impact. No matter how much they taunted him, no matter how much they ridiculed him, no matter what challenge they said, he stayed focused. He knew he had an assignment. He knew he had to give up that ghost and he had to die on the cross. He knew he couldn't die up the hill. He knew he couldn't die as the cross was. He knew what his assignment was. He knew he had to hang on that cross for our sins, for the assignment to be complete. Amen. And so he stuck to it. And what am I saying tonight? I'm saying you got an assignment from God and it may be unpleasant. It may involve some sacrifice. It may involve some inconvenience, but for the sake of your family, for the sake of your children, for the sake of those that God has assigned to you to be blessed as a result of what you're going through right now, you better to hang right on that cross until God pulls it and reveals it and makes it come to pass. Do not step away from it because of the inconvenience. Understand that God is going to get the glory. And what I really love is that in the end of it, God is going to show that he was with you all along. But look at how Jesus is handling this. And he's letting us see if you're really going to be my followers, if you're really going to say that you belong to me, then this is how you begin to operate. Now, this may not be how you've operated in the past. Maybe you never thought about it this way, but this is our challenge now. We have to do it this way now. Amen? All right, so let's move on. I did have to mute that because I didn't recognize it was doing all of that, uh, but let's turn on to John chapter 19 because I want to get through all of this tonight. It's, 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 it's going to be what you need to do whatever it is that God wants you to do, and I just know he's doing something amazing in your life um, because I feel the pull on me to make sure that um, no matter how challenging this is, no matter what technical difficulties I'm facing or what I'm going through to continue to pour out because I know that there's if there's only one viewer, um, you're the one that God needed to get this message to complete the assignment he has in your life. Amen. Um, it's not about the size of the audience. It's about the faithfulness of carrying out the assignment. So whether it's one or 1,000 of you watching tonight, I know that God had a word for you and I'm trusting that it will work but it's do what it's supposed to do in your life. All right, so you should be there with me, John chapter 19. John chapter 19, we're gonna look at verse 19 through 22. If you're there, just say, <laughs> type amen. And I won't see it, right? John chapter 19. This is just hilarious. I'm telling you, these um, everything that I have here is trying to malfunction on me. All right, here we go. John chapter 19. We're going to read verses 19 through 22. All right. So 
as long as that took me, you should definitely be there by now. So let me go on ahead and read it. Um, John chapter 19, 19 through 22. And Pilate posted a sign on the cross that read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. The place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And the sign was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. <laughs> so that many people could read it. Then the leading priest objected and said to Pilate, change it from the king of the Jews to he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate replied, no, what I have written, I have written. Whew, this is deep. Let, let's dissect this for a minute, all right? so. Whew, this is good. I'm telling you. Let's let's just kind of take it apart. So the first thing I want you to see is what words were fastened to the cross where Jesus was crucified. If you can text or chat, go ahead and do that. What were the words that were fastened to the cross where Jesus was crucified? All right, you got it, I'm sure, even though I can't see it. Um, it says right here, the words were king of the Jews. Now Think about this for a second. That was written in three different languages. Hmm. Why do you think that was written in three different languages? In Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Well, the scripture tells us why. It says so that many people could read it. So it was intentional. Uh, to expand the audience of who uh, he should be humiliated in the presence of. They wanted to make sure as many people as possible were aware of what um, he um, had been punished for as well as who he had claimed to be. And then what is interesting is, as you can see here, when the priest objected and said, I don't want it to say that, you know, we're not acknowledging that he was the king of the Jews. They, he said he was the king of the Jews. And ironically enough, Pilate had enough sense because he pretty much understood somehow that's what's going to stay. This is the king of the Jews. Now watch this. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going somewhere. And I can't give it all to you tonight, too, because you do know that we're going to have an uh, amazing service on Sunday, right? In fact, I might make it a little cliffhanger just to make sure that you come to service on Sunday, because Sunday we've already got the lesson title, and Sunday's sermon is called The Come Back. The Come Back. And it's going to be a Resurrection Sunday service with power and anointing and authority because we're going to talk about the comeback all right but right now let's stick with the cross first corinthians chapter 1 verse 17 and 18 let's read that together all right again for you just joining us this is new living translation for christ didn't send me to baptize but to preach the good news and not with clever speech for fear that the cross of christ would lose its power the message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction, but we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. All right, so this is Paul talking here, and um, those of you that really have been studying for a while, you know who Paul is, and you understand his background. I mean, I just love Paul. He's awesome. He's amazing. Um, and what makes him so much more amazing is he started off being someone who did not know Jesus and was a persecutor of Christians. And yet God was able to just do some awesome things in him. And so here we have him saying that he's not here to, um, to do some of the things that I guess we expect, you know, people to do today. Um, he says, you know, I'm here to preach the good news. Um, I'm not here to give you clever speech or um, as I was saying to entertain you. Um, I'm not here to impress you even. 
Um, I'm not here to show you that I know the word and I went to this college and I can use these Greek and um, Hebrew terms with so much um, intensity. You know, he said, I'm, I, I'm not going to play that game with you for fear that the cross would lose its power. Wow. What does that mean? He said that fear that the cross of Christ would lose his power? What does that mean? How can the cross of Christ lose its power? Well, I want us to pay attention to that tonight because he wanted us to make sure that we recognize that the work of God was finished because of Jesus Christ. So the only person we really want anybody to be impressed with is Jesus. That's key because I think a lot of times we forget that. We, we want them to be impressed with us. We want to make sure we say something that, you know, just leaves an impact. And if you're not careful, that can be your motivation. You know, I want them to think, oh, that was awesome. Pastor Alicia, you preached the word. That was the, <laughs> who cares? <laughs> what does that have to do with anything? If I'm in, interested in you being impressed with me and you are, and I succeed in that, how does that help you? As my mom used to say, I don't have a heaven or a hell to put you in. You have to be impressed with the cross of Christ. I have to preach the gospel in such a way that you come to know him through me. And so I have to be careful. You have to be careful. Anyone who is taking up the cross has to be careful that the people see Jesus in us and not so concerned that they see us. All right. So that is important right here. And we have to make sure that we don't make the cross powerless, that we, we don't make what he did of no um, concern because we're going to try to do it all in our own strength. We've got to understand that the power comes from coming to the cross. The power comes from coming to him, from trusting in him, from surrendering to him, from giving our lives to him. And so be very careful because we don't want to set ourselves up as a, a mini Jesus in anyone's life. That could be a boyfriend that, you know, won't read the word for himself. You know, that could be um, a church member who is determined that they're going to depend on you instead of learning how to go and depend on God. And so sometimes people will begin to think whether it's a family member or whoever that you're being mean, but you're leading them back to Christ because you know that that's where the power is. That's where the salvation is, that you don't have the power. They think you have it. They think you have the $20 that they need. They think you have the word that they need, but you have to keep leading them back to Christ and to the cross because that is where the power is. And when we don't do that, we make the cross of Christ lose its power. Amen. Um, we have to be careful because when that happens, it doesn't have meaning. And a lot of us can think of contexts where we just feel like, okay, you forgot what that cross was really about. Um, you know, when it becomes a fashion statement that people wear, um, you know, just as just a fashion and not embracing what it means to you, to me, to us as believers. So what we're saying is there's nothing about the cross that we want to trivialize. There's nothing about the sacrifice that he made for us that we want to diminish. And we want to forever respect, forever um, appreciate, forever hold dear and, and, and true and continue to make sure. And that's why even in the midst of our Easter celebrations, we, we keep saying resurrection. Um, we want to make sure that in every context that we have an opportunity with our children, with our family, with those that we come into contact with to get sure that they understand. I don't mind eating the Easter eggs with you. I will do that. I don't mind, you know, boiling them and dipping them with you and having the Easter egg hunt. We can do all of that. But please let us first give honor to God and what he has done in our life. Let us first continue to thank him for giving us life and giving him, us life more abundant. Let's not make the cross of no value. Let's not get to the place where we forget what it's all about and the celebration is around something that has nothing to do with what he has done for us. And then, I mean, just think about it for a second. I, one example that kind of seems, you know, simple to me is a birthday party. You know, imagine if you were planning a birthday party for your daughter and um, 
you know, as you were going through it, you made all these plans and all these preparations and, you know, did all this and spent all this money and everybody got to the birthday party and didn't even say nothing to her. <laughs> you know, forget they didn't bring her a gift because you know that's how they do it anyway. <laughs> forget they didn't bring a card, you know, folks don't do cards no more. You know, they'll email you a card. They'll post you a card on Facebook, right? <laughs> Amen. But they just don't acknowledge you at all. You know, they come to the party, eat up your food, tear up your house, talk to each other, and don't even acknowledge <laughs> that you are the guest of honor. That would be highly offensive, right? Okay, so just kind of put it in context. And, and, and trust me, that doesn't even compare on the scale of the level of pain uh, that that would cause our Heavenly Father if we as believers. Now, we, what the world does, you know, they don't know any better. And that's what the Christ is saying. So the message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed to destruction. You know, they don't understand it. But that's what, what our job is. That's our job to continue to educate them. You know, a lot of times when people say season's greetings, you know, I feel obligated to say Merry Christmas back. I'm obligated. I'm, I, I have to continue to stand for what is important to me. I recognize everybody else may not be celebrating that. I recognize that's not the politically correct thing to do. But, you know, God showed me a long time ago, if you're ashamed of me on earth, I will be ashamed of you in heaven. And so I had to make up my mind. I'm willing to be persecuted. I'm willing to, to offend someone if necessary. I'm willing for someone to get um, upset. But I have to be able to continue to present him in each and every circumstance so that he will get the glory and that his death on the cross maintains its power in my life. Amen. All right. So let's go ahead and move on. We do have a couple more scriptures. I want to make sure that we do get through before our lesson concludes on tonight. So let's go to Galatians chapter six, verse 14. That is where we have to look at next um, Galatians chapter six, verse 14. And I want us to read something really quickly because this is, you know, this is what it's about for us as believers. It says, as for me, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, my interest in this world has been crucified and the world's interest in me has also died. Boom. That's it. Look at that. It's saying because of that cross, my interest in this world has been crucified. I mean, what does that mean to you? Because Paul is saying that's what his source for boasting is. You know, what is our source for boasting? Is it is it the street we live on? Is it our zip code? You know, is it is it our car? Is it our figures, if it's five or if it's six? Is, and what is our source for boasting? Paul said his source for boasting and, and that he never wanted to boast about anything other than the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's powerful, y'all. I mean, on tonight, when we begin to start preparing to reflect on what our Lord and our Savior went through for us, that's powerful that we would only boast in him. We would only boast in what he was able to do. We would only boast in what he was able to overcome and that through him, we can do all things because we get our strength from him. And so anything we boast on, it should be connected through what we get through him. Because of you, Lord, I can do this. Because of you, God, I have accomplished this. Because of you, God. You know, when I first passed the bar exam, you know, people thought I was being really churchy, but you know, I changed the license plates on my car. Everything said glory to the number two, JC, because I wanted to make sure that as high as I went, I kept humbling myself that glory belongs to you, Lord. Had it not been for you, had it not been for your goodness, had it not been for your grace, I would not be where I am right now. You know, even right now, I'm experiencing a certain elevation in my business. Anything I experience elevation in, I'm very careful not to boast. I'm very careful not to say, yeah, you know, I'm, yeah, I am. Kind of, no, 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 no. That's that. That is something that as you begin to recognize how dangerous that is, you will be afraid to step into that level of boastfulness. But what you see here from Paul is saying that the only thing I'm going to boast about is my Lord. And that is the impression that I want us to leave with tonight from tonight's life application Bible study, because what you're going to find is God will take you higher and higher and higher if you boast in him. 
It's a very simple principle. Just think about it this way. God is looking for people to be his representatives here in the earth. And how insulting is it for him to pour out his anointing, to pour out his presence, to pour out his provision, to give you the desires of your heart. And then when you make it to the podium, you're like, you know, I like to thank myself and myself and myself. <laughs> you know, how insulting is that? Think about the award ceremonies and how they get up there and, you know, they, they try to remember, okay, who's the producer, who was the writer, who was the, you know, they don't want to leave anybody out. Okay, well, that's how we have to be. Let's eliminate everybody else. Thank you, Lord. And wherever we get, we give him the praise and we give him the honor and we give him the glory for what it is that we are doing or what it is that we are accomplishing or what it is that we have. And watch how he will begin to elevate you because you gave him the glory and you didn't take the credit for what he did in your life. I'm telling you, these are the little nuggets that will begin to just elevate you quickly in God into leadership in various areas of your life if you begin to recognize that all he needs is for you to submit to his leadership and then he will take you higher than you ever thought imaginable because that's just the type of God he is. Amen? Amen. Let's move on. I want to see something else. I want you to see something else. Um, for the interest of time, I'm looking at the time. I'm going to do two of them quickly and then um, we'll close. Ephesians chapter 2. You're still with me? Y'all hanging in there? The connection's good. You can't chat with me, but you can still see me. Praise God. All right. Ephesians 2, chapter 16. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross. And our hostility towards each other was put to death. This is the hostility he's talking about between man and God. This is why he had to suffer a horrible death on the cross for our sake. He had to make that bridge for us. He had to make that connection for us. You know, if any of you have ever seen a scenario where you can't get from point A to point B, you need some type of bridge. You know, Christ was that for us. He was that reconciliation because of the fall, the great fall, Adam and Eve, at the very beginning of the time, we were separated from God and there was no other way. They kept trying and they brought sacrifice after sacrifice and nothing would appease for our sins. And so God went ahead and sent his only begotten son. And the plan was very, very simple, that he was going to walk this earth so that he would be able to identify with us, identify with the, the tests and the trials that we have gone through, and then get the victory and show us that we too can get the victory as we put him as the head of our life. And that is so important to me because in many arenas, we have somebody already in the head, you know, somebody the head of our company, somebody the head of our household, you know, but Make God the head of your life. Um, he might, he, somebody else might be in charge at your job, or somebody else may even be in charge, you know, in some other area. But if you begin to seriously make Jesus Christ the head of your life, the CEO, if He calls all the shots, if everything that you do stems from the leading that He gives you, then you will find success because His His company is very successful. And you have to remain in his company. You can't just keep, you know, bouncing in and out. You know, okay, Jesus, I'm with you as long as you, you know, charting out the path that I'm in agreement with. But when you start, you know, giving me some instructions or directions that cause me discomfort, you know, I want to leave the company. You know, how successful would you be in any company if, you know, you leave? And then you come back and then you leave and then you come back. Most likely you will come back and somebody that you started with, you'll see them in a very high position because they made the sacrifice. They were faithful. They stayed. They learned. They trained. They elevated. They grew. And then you're still frustrated because you're back in the mail room, but you would be further ahead if you would just stay grounded and allow God to work the things out that he's trying to do in you. You know, many of us haven't gotten that lesson yet, both in the world and in our walk with God. You know, the first thing somebody say to us on our job, we quit. You know, the first thing, you know, they go wrong in our relationship, I'm out. You know, and so we do the same thing with God. But tonight, I'm trying to encourage you that for where you're trying to go excel, remember, our commitment is we want to excel. You know, now I don't know what they're trying to do somewhere else, but here, our goal 
is to grow more and more like Christ so he can elevate us and cause us to excel in every area of our life. We receive life eternally and we want to receive life here more abundantly. We want everything God has for us and we want to excel. Okay, well, if that's what you want, you have to make him your savior and your Lord. You have to submit to him. He has to be the head honcho, the boss, the CEO, the one calling the shots and trust him. Because when you recognize that Jesus is the one calling the shots, what is it that you have to be afraid of? He has conquered death. He has all power is in his hand. When he calls a shot, it is going to be victorious. And so even though as he went through, you may be at a place where the discomfort is taking place, but it's for a reason and it's only for a season. But if you stay the course, God has something for you, but he wants to see, will you carry the cross or will you drop it every time it gets heavy? He didn't drop it. Even though it got heavy, he kept carrying the cross for us. Will you keep carrying the cross for him tonight? Will you make that decision that even though it's getting heavy, even though everybody's looking at you wondering why you are further along, why you haven't done this yet, why you haven't accomplished this yet, that you're not going to detour from the path that God has placed before you, that you're going to stay the course because you understand that he has given you an assignment and that what you're going through right now is just part of what you need to go through in your process to be prepared for where he's taking you to. See, when we get that, then we get the elevation. Then we're able to excel. Aren't you still ready to excel with me? All right. Amen. I'm just checking. I'm just checking. All right. Let's look at Philippians chapter three, verse 18. Pastor Charles talked about this a little bit, and then I'm going to try to close. Philippians chapter three, verse 18. I hope you're enjoying the study tonight because it's my desire for each and every one of us to excel. And we need to get an understanding of some small little details that we need to make adjustments in in our life for God to get the glory. All right. And I just believe once you get that information, you make that adjustment. Boom. It's a next level for you. All right. First, um, we're in Philippians chapter three, verses 18 through 19. It says, for I have told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct shows they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. They are headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things, and they think only about this life on here on earth. <clears throat> This is kind of hard um, to digest because, I mean, it's it's the truth anyhow. Um, and we need to absorb that and we need to be cognizant of that. And then, of course, we need to uh, make sure that we do not become that. Um, so let's look at it real quickly. This hatred of the cross that is being expressed here. Uh, and he said, I say it with tears in my eyes because it causes him pain, you know, even as I get a lump in my throat. Um, to discuss it with you, but that is how our conduct shows that we're really not followers of Christ. Um, when we have reached the place where we have made ourselves an enemy, um, where we are fighting against the very thing that it is that God is doing, um, we have become an enemy. And, and we see this sometimes when we are led by our flesh and the works of our flesh, as opposed to being led by the Holy Spirit. And sometimes it will take you in a direction that you just never even thought you were possible to go in. And you'll look back up and you'll say, did I really do that? Was that, was that really me? Uh, and so we begin to look and we see here that he says that they're headed for D destruction all right so what is this what is this what is this pastor alicia okay this is this is a self examination check see the great thing about this is i can't see you <laughs> i don't know what reaction you're having i don't know how this is impacting you i don't know if you're being convicted right now but i do know this you have an opportunity now tonight to repent and head in the road of excellence you will remain on this road and go to destruction if you do not make a decision to make a difference and to make a change. And God is saying here, 
that if your appetite is for things that don't please him, you know, you're, you're just happy to be doing wrong. You brag about doing wrong. You have an appetite about shameful things. I mean, in the interest of time, I'm just not even going to try to touch it to break it down because I just feel like the, the power of the Holy Spirit is going to begin to reveal to you, even as you're watching this, you know, okay, I, I know what you mean. You don't need to go any further. But you think only about life here on this earth. You don't think about what the decisions you're making today and how that will impact you tomorrow. You don't think about how this impacts your eternal life. You don't think about what impact this is having in the spiritual realm. The only concern is about what I can do for me today. If that's you today, it's time to make a transition. That is a path that will take you to destruction. That is not the path that will allow you to excel. And so we just want you to begin to just go ahead and seek God and say, you know what, Lord, until you begin to reveal it to me tonight, I didn't even recognize, you know, it, in such certainty what I was doing. But now I repent. I ask you to forgive me and teach me how to follow you. Teach me how to pick up the cross. You know, I've just been around such wayward people. I was brought up in such an environment where everybody just believed, go for your own, go for self, do what you got to do to get ahead. Every man for himself. I'm just, this is new to me, God. I, 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 I do want to follow you. I do believe you. I do know that you died for me. And I do know that I have a better life awaiting me. I do know I have an inheritance. I just don't know how to tap into it. You know, everybody I know, you know, they're phony. You know, I don't really have anybody I look up to that I can believe in, but I believe in you, God. And I just need you to help me to develop a relationship with you so I can learn how to follow you. Like, like, like Pastor Alicia saying, I need to follow you now. If that's you, just tell him that. And he will come into your heart and he will begin to reveal to you. He will begin to send you godly witnesses and godly examples and people that you can begin to be, just come to and understand that, you know what, they're going to show you the way to Christ. Like I said at the beginning of tonight's lesson, not the way to admire them, not the way to be just like them, but to be just like Christ. That is the way that God is training you to go so that you will excel. And so the path of destruction, that's no longer for you because I just believe by faith that if you caught this revelation tonight, you have turned, you have reverted, and you are on a new path to excel. Amen. See, that's what Saul went through when he became Paul. So if God did it for him, he can do it for you. He is not a respecter of persons. And if you don't understand that, I need you to go and study about Paul tonight because Paul was one of the most amazing men used mightily for God's glory. And he was just like you on a path of destruction. But then he had an encounter with God, just like you're having an encounter with God tonight to turn his life around. So don't ever let anybody make you think that you've gone too far. You've done too much. You've been through too many things. God still can use you. And I'm declaring and decreeing that he's going to use you starting tonight. Amen. All right, let's go ahead with one more scripture. I know we're running out of time, but I do want us to um, to see this right here. Uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 and 15. Colossians chapter 2. We're going to end on this and we're going to pick up on Sunday. Oh boy, Sunday's going to be powerful. I can't wait. All right, you're there. Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. It says, you were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ. For he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. Somebody say the cross, the cross, verse 15. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on that cross. Oh, we're not having church, so let me just bring it down a notch. We have a Bible study, but I just get excited. Ooh, <laughs> I get excited about the cross because I get excited about, I understand cancellation in a way that you just don't understand. You have to understand by me having a background in, in law and going to court, you know, I just visualize what that's like to have charges. <laughs> just imagine, you know, a prosecutor, you know, and, and, and the enemy is a prosecutor. And just imagine him pulling out your rap sheet. 
just imagine him pulling out everything you've done, the stuff that don't nobody else know, the stuff that you would never even tell your best friend, the things that you've been through, the things that you, the decisions you've made, the, 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 the depths that you've stooped to, and your, your darkest hour. And imagine just having that all just your record of every sin and every transgression just brought out against you. And imagine Jesus Christ being your lawyer and he walks in. And I mean, once he walks in and he shows those 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 holes in his hands and, and, and the judge and look and he said, whoa, wait a minute. All your sins, all the charges against you are dropped. I mean, just think about that in the natural. If you were facing life in prison, if you were facing uh, death row and somebody was able to walk in that courtroom and speak on your behalf and as a result of it, all the charges were wiped clean, glory be to God. That's me and you. All the charges are wiped, wiped clean because of his death on the cross for me and for you. If that's not reason enough for you to get up tomorrow, to get up tonight, to get up day after day after day and say, now that I'm free, I'm going to live for you. I had a death sentence waiting on me. So whatever I do now, it, it, why not make it for you? If it, if it had not been for you, if you hadn't walked in this courtroom, I would have never saw the light of day. They were going to take me behind bars. I was going to go to that cell. And then one day I was going to wake up and they were going to execute me. And I would have never lived again anyway. So since you purchased my freedom, since he who the son sets free is free indeed. And because you died on the cross for me, now I have life. Why not live that life for you? How can I live that life and take it for granted and just do what I want to do? You bought the life. You purchased it. You died on the cross for me, but then I'm going to go do what I want to do. Really? Really? <laughs> no. And I did excel, church. Okay? So what we're saying to you tonight is this cross, this cross. Look at here. Let's, let's close. Colossians chapter 1. And I just want you to see something right here. Well, chapter 2, I meant. He said, he canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. See, those sins, those charges were dropped as he was nailed to the cross. That's why he couldn't get down even when they were taunting him. He had to do it. He had to do it. He had to finish the assignment in order for the work to be complete in our lives. He did it. He finished his assignment. Will you finish yours? That's the question I have for you tonight. You know what, Excel Church, I um, I appreciate what God has done for us. And I know that you appreciate what he's done in your life as well. And sometimes it just takes that extra push. Sometimes it just takes that extra reminder, you know, because we get trapped in the hustle and the bustle of life. You know, I got to do this. I got to get here. I got to get this. I got to get that. But even in the midst of that, we are taking time to say, God, I thank you for what you've done for me. Show me what you want to do through me as well. Can we do that now? Can we just pray and then end tonight's life application Bible study? All right, let's do that. <clears throat> Father, in the name of Jesus, we just come to you tonight with all simplicity and sincerity and earnestness of heart and just say thank you. Thank you, Lord, for being our God. Thank you, Lord for providing a way of redemption for us. Thank you for sending your only begotten son. You sent him here. You knew what he would go through, Lord. It's hard for us to fathom as parents, sending your child somewhere where you knew that they would be ridiculed, where you knew that they would be mistreated. You knew that they would be crucified. But you did it for us, Lord. You purchased our way. You made a way for us to have life again and to have it more abundantly. You sent a seed and you sowed it in the ground. And oh, what a great harvest it brought in return. God, help us to be worthy of that sacrifice that you made for us. Help us to make the cross prominent in our life, not just in Easter, 
not just for Resurrection Sunday, 365 days out of the year, Lord. Help us to make the cross at the forefront of our minds. Help us to seek opportunities to plant seeds that will bring forth a harvest for your glory. Help us to harvest souls, God. Help us to harvest our assignments. Help us to seek you, Lord, for clarity as to what our assignments are. And once we receive them, Lord, give us the strength that comes from Christ to complete them. You said he who has begun a work in me is faithful to complete it. Even until the end of time, God, complete the work you began in each and every one of us. Don't let us get down from the cross. Father, give us the strength to continue to bear every burden, every ridicule, every persecution. Father God, help us to stay focused on glorifying you and bringing your will to pass here on earth as it already is in heaven. Father, let us meet you one day and hear you say, good job, well done, my good and faithful servant. We desire to hear that more than we desire accolades from the world. We desire to please you tonight, God. So we thank you again for the cross. And we thank you, Father God, for the reminder. We love you. We count it as already done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, 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 amen. All right, a couple quick announcements. Join us at Excel Church at 460 Northfield Road in Bedford, Ohio, this Resurrection Sunday, 1130 a.m. Follow us, connect with us on social media. You can reach us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Excel Cleveland, E-X-C-E-L Cleveland, one word. All right, this was Pastor Alicia on behalf of our senior pastor, Pastor Charles Lytle, and all of the amazing and fabulous members of Excel Church. We wish you a good night, and we're waiting to see you, Excel. Good night, everyone. <laughs>